wrong one. Um, so we talked about in the previous week that we were um, dealing with accounting for a retail business. And this week, with a retail business, they purchase their inventory to resell. So we need to keep track of the type of inventory that's on hand and the inventory that has been sold. So this week is going to focus on specifically the inventory that we need to account for in a business. Again, we've got a lot of different objectives to cover. But the first um, objective is how we control inventory. We need to protect the inventory from damage and probably even more important than damage is to protect it from theft. And we need to make sure that what is on hand is what we are accurately reporting for the financial statements. So what we're showing is truly accurate with what is being presented in the financial statements. Controls for safeguarding inventory begin right away when we even begin to order inventory. We have a purchase order. That purchase order basically authorizes the purchase of inventory from a vendor. Once that inventory comes into the warehouse, we have a receiving report. That receiving report records the receipt of the inventory, okay? The subsidiary inventory ledger provides a record of the amount of inventory available and helps a company keep inventory quantities at the proper levels. The way we protect the inventory will be pretty much um, authorizations. So only certain people are allowed in the warehouse. A specific person is going to receive the inventory on hand and match it up with what in fact was ordered. We do that just so they don't walk away. How many of you guys have ever worked at a store where there are safeguards to inventory? Give me an example of what you're talking about. Like, explain what, how they did it. Yep. Okay. Um, we put, like, tech stuff inside these boxes that you can all me open with magnetic keys. Cool. And do only certain people have the magnetic keys to do that? Anyone else? Yes. Well, we have just like specific uh, departments for like receiving or like uh, for stocking the inventory. You know, there's only like a couple people in each department uh, for our receiving. Uh, we have a receiving manager and two receiving uh, people that take all the data. And then we have two people that put away everything on the shelf. Awesome. I remember when my daughter worked at Finish Line, this is probably 15, maybe 20 years ago at the Mall of America. There was only one person that was allowed in the warehouse, in the stock room, you know, to get shoes. I'm sure they still walked off with them anyway. Anyone else had something to say? Yeah. You, yes. Oh, um, yeah, I haven't worked this place, but like that, like Walmart, like they have like the locked, uh, Yes. Yep. The security. Yep. They have to in this day and age. You know what else is interesting? At a TJ Maxx or a Marshalls, 
Guess what is the average age and gender of those who steal? Yes, yes. Isn't that interesting? Never think just because someone's older, they don't have it in them. Isn't that sad? Um, so as we move on, examples of security measures can be storing inventory in areas that are restricted to only authorized employees, locking up high-priced inventory in cabinets, as you guys have talked about, using two-way mirrors, cameras, security tags, and guards. So a physical inventory or count of inventory needs to be taken near year end so we can confirm that the quantity of inventory reported in the financial statements is accurate. After the quantity of inventory on hand is determined, the cost of the inventory is assigned so we can report it accurately in the financial statements. So here we've got several assumptions pertaining inventory. When identical units of merchandise are acquired at different units of cost during a period, there can become an issue. When that happens, it's necessary to decide its cost using what we call a cost flow assumption and related inventory. So say we might have an identical item and we have um, 50 of them, but we purchased some of those units at one price, some of those units at another price, some at another price. What we need to do is decide how are we going to figure out the actual cost of that item. And there's three ways we can do it. We know for purposes of in and out, we try to sell and get out of our inventory the oldest ones first, right? But for purposes of accounting, we can choose one of three options. We can choose what we call FIFO, the first ones in or the first ones out, which we do in a normal manner, but for accounting purposes, we can choose that. Or we can choose what we call LIFO. The last ones in, or the last ones we purchased, or the first ones we say we sold. Or we can come up with a weighted average method. And we're gonna go through all three of these assumptions and explain how we account for them. Now we know technically they're going to sell the last, the oldest items. But from an accounting standpoint, companies get to determine it. Once they determine the method, they have to stick with it. Okay? So assume that three identical units of merchandise are purchased during May. On May 10th, we purchased one unit for nine bucks. On May 18th, we purchased one unit for $13. And then on May 24th, we purchased one unit for $14. So we have three units on hand and the cost altogether for those three units is $36. We can assume the average cost, $36 divided by three units, is 12 bucks. That would be like the weighted average. Got it? Now, let's assume that one unit is sold on May 30th for $20. Depending upon which unit was sold, the gross profit varies from either $11 to $6. Meaning, if we show that the unit that was sold cost $9, then we would have a gross profit there of $11. If we show the um, one unit that was sold 
was the unit we purchased on May 18th, then we would have a $7 profit. Or the May 24th unit, we would have a $6 profit. And those other two units that weren't sold would be left in ending inventory. So as you can see, there's various ways to be able to account for that profit. <coughs> when we talk about what we call the specific identification inventory flow method, the unit sold is identified with a specific purchase. The ending inventory is made up of the remaining units on hand. Where would this be applicable? Automobiles? So a, a Toyota Prius isn't just a Toyota Prius. A Toyota Prius may have <clears throat> upgraded seats. It could have a better sound system. Do you understand what I'm kind of getting at? <clears throat> what else could um, make this a unique Prius? MP miles per gallon. It, it could maybe have a different hybrid method or, who you know, turbo. I don't know what. But usually with automobiles, that is a specific identification method. They don't produce 10 Toyota Priuses with different... Um, um, specifications and sell them for all the same and charge it for all the same, correct? So each one has its unique cost because it's that car is specifically identified with this cost. Can anyone think of another type of product that may use specific identification when it's sold? Homes? Jewelry? When you go and purchase a piece of jewelry for um, a significant, that specific jewelry is going to be linked with a cost because it's unique on its own. Yes, another question. Technology. Technology too. Now, a chip is a chip is a chip. You know, they mass produce chips. But depending on if you want a computer that has specific um, pieces to it, unique items, that's going to be specific identification. Under the first in and first out inventory cost flow method, the first units purchased are assumed to be the first sold and the ending inventories made up the, of the most recent purchases. So we use when they're identical products or um, items that we are selling, we can use various methods. The first in, first out, the last in, first out, and this weighted average inventory method. Those will not be used when you have specific identification, what we were talking about. But there is so much that is mass produced and they're identical. And so we get to choose which method. The first in, first out assumes that the first units purchased are assumed to be the first units sold and the inven ending inventory is made up of those most recent purchases. Under LIFO, we assume the last units purchased are the first to be sold, and the ending inventory is made up of the first purchases. Under the weighted average cost method, Sometimes we call it the average cost flow me method. The cost of the units sold in the ending inventory is a weighted average of all the purchase costs. Okay? And we have to keep track of the average base. We have to make it weighted. So here you see we had three purchases, one for May 10th one for May 18th, and one for May 24th. If we show that the item was done through FIFO, the first ones in are the first ones out, that assumption, then we would assume that the cost of goods sold would have been that first purchase, the $9. Okay? If we would go with the LIFO method, then we would assume here that the last one we purchased,
for $14 is the first one we're selling. And then if we go with the weighted average method, we would take all three of them, add them together, divide them by the number of units, and it's going to be an average. It's going to be in the middle of them in a period of rising prices. Any questions on that? So here, the LIFO, or excuse me, the FIFO, LIFO, and weighted average cost methods are illustrated under what we call a perpetual inventory system. For purposes, we are going to say the following data for item 127B are used. So this item 127B shows on January 1st, we had on hand 1,000 units with a cost of $20. On January 4th, we sold $30 per unit and we sold 700 of them. Then on January 10th, we purchased 500 units at $22.40 a piece. Then on January 22nd, we sold 360 of them. On January 28th, we sold 240 units. And then on January 30th, we purchased 600 units at $23.30 a piece. So this is the illustration or the example we're going to use to come up with our various different figures. When the FIFO method is used, costs are included in the cost of goods sold in the order in which they were purchased. Usually we call it the physical flow of goods because we want the oldest ones to get out of the store sooner. So the FIFO method often provides the results that are the same as would have, would have been obtained basically using um, the specific identification as far as those coming in right away or those going out. Here you see if we showed the um, cost of goods sold on January 4th, we would show the accounts receivable of 21000 credit our sales, and we would also take the cost of goods, 14000 and we would reduce our inventory by 14000 Because again, those items were sold, or we purchased them at 20 bucks a piece. Here on January 10th, when we purchased inventory, we purchased it um, 11200 We debit that because it was 500 units at $22.40. We credit our payable. We'll, we'll go through this in detail, but what we're showing here is exactly during the FIFO method showing what we're selling based on the first ones that come in or the first ones that go out. So the ending balance on January 31st is $18,460. This balance is made up of two layers of inventory. It shows we have on January 10th left over 200 quantity at $22.40. And then we had a purchase on January 30th where we purchased 600 units at $23.30. So we tagged the cost of goods sold to those that came first in. And what's left at the end of the period, what's still in inventory that hasn't sold, would be these items using the first in, first out method. When the LIFO method is used, 
the cost of the units sold is the cost of the most recent purchases. Now, you can use LIFO for income tax purposes, um, but for purposes of financial accounting is what we're talking about here. When the LIFO method is used, the subsidiary inventory ledger sometimes just main, is maintained only in units. Here is the example of when we use the LIFO method, we show when we sold on January 4th um, 700 units, we show the sale price was the $30, $30 per unit, but the cost of goods sold here would be 14 um, 700 units at 20 bucks. We again show what we purchased in inventory. Then when we see the January 22nd sale, do you see here we're going to take the first group, the 300 units at 20 bucks, and we're going to take the 140 units at $22.40. So it's just showing you how the numbers are going to appear different. The ending balance on January 31st doing LIFO is made up of two layers, the beginning balance on January 1st, and then there's a group on January 30th. Then using the weighted average method, what we'll do is we'll come up with a weighted average. So if we've got so many units we've purchased, we'll allocate those units by the number of units available. Here's our first question. Which of the following inventory costing methods would be associated with the highest cost of goods sold expense on the income statement assuming a period of rising cost? Excellent, C. We usually assume costs are gonna rise, okay? When the periodic inventory system is used, only revenue is recorded each time a sale is made. So the perpetual system keeps track of inventory and what we're getting rid of. When we use the periodic method, we don't keep track of inventory as it's leaving. We only keep track of the inventory at the end of the period. A physical inventory is taken to determine the cost of the inventory and the cost of the goods sold. Like the perpetual inventory system, a cost flow assumption needs to be made when identical units are acquired at different unit costs during the period. Let's look at this exercise. This is using the perpetual system. Beginning inventory, purchases, and sales data for DVD players are shown here. The business maintains a perpetual inventory system costing by the first in, first out method. Determine the cost of goods sold for each sale and the inventory balance after each sale, presenting the data in the form illustrated in the book on Exhibit 3. And let's just look at this. So we see here, the we see what was purchased. We have a balance on November 1st of 140 units at $29. We sold 10 units, or on November 10th, we sold 110 units. So if we look at this, when we sold um, 110 units, do you see using FIFO, we're going to take 
those November 1st sitting in inventory. We're going to take 110 of those units at $29. And those are the units we're saying we sold. Okay? So what's left are just 30 units at $29. Does that make sense? Then on November 15th, we purchased 150 units at $30. So after we purchased that 150 units at $30, we now have 30 units on hand at $29, and we have 150 units on hand at $30. Bucks. Does that make sense how we're keeping track of that? Then, on November 20th, we sold 120 units. Well, if it's first in, first out, aren't we going to sell those 30 units sitting at 29 bucks? And then we're going to sell the remaining 90 units at the 30 bucks? So what's on hand? At the end of the period, We've got 60 units left at 30 bucks. Got it? Then on November 24th, we sold 35 units. Well, didn't we sell 35 of those 60 units on hand at 30 bucks? So we sold those, but what's left? Only 25 units are left, right? Then on November 24th, excuse me, on November 30th, we purchased 140 units at $34. So we've got those 140 units plus what was left from previously the 25 units on hand. This is the method using FIFO, the first in, first out, to keep track specifically of what items are sold, and what is the cost of the items still sitting in inventory? Any questions on this? Now, if we do this method using FIFO, assume that the business maintains a perpetual inventory system by the last in and first out method. <clears throat> We're going to do it the same way. <coughs> do you see here? The last in, first out, November 1st, we've got 140 units on hand. On November 10th, when we sell 110 units, all we have on hand are those 140 units, okay? So we're going to sell 110 of those 140 units, and we have left 30 units at 29 bucks a unit. Then on November 15th, we purchase 150 units at 30 bucks a unit, okay? So we have the 30 units on hand at the beginning of the period, plus we now have another 150 units. So guys, when we sell those 120 units, do you see we want to sell those units at the highest price, those last ones that came in? the most recent purchase. So it shows here those 120 units, the cost is 30 bucks a unit. So what's on hand after the sell of those units would be 30 units at 30 bucks and 30 units at $29. Then when we sold another 35 units, 30 of those units will be the last ones we purchased at 30 bucks. It's now the, that um, latest purchase is gone, so we have to grab five units from the beginning inventory. And what's left on hand then are the 25 units from the beginning inventory. Then again, we purchased 140 units at 34 bucks. Does that make sense? So you can see how your balances flow because you're going to keep it updated 
all the time. Any questions? Now, beginning inventory, purchases, and sales data for prepaid cell phones for December are shown here. We've got 310 units at $88. We have purchases on December 10th, 144 units at 90. We have um, another purchase on December 20th, 240 units at 96. And then we have some sales. December 12th, we sold 240 units. December 14th, we sold 166 units. December 31st, we sold 200 units. Assuming that the perpetual inventory system is used by LIFO, determine the cost of goods sold for each sale and the inventory balance after each sale. So guys, take about four minutes and attempt this. I'll go through it all, but I want you to see if it's making sense to you. Start with what's on hand on December 1st, then show your purchase on December 10th, then when you show that sale on December 12th, where are you taking it from, okay? I'm gonna give you a couple minutes here. You guys tell me when you're ready for me to go because I don't want to interrupt you. Okay? So, remember, we started 
with 310 units on hand at 88 bucks. And then on December 10th, we purchased another 144 units for 90 bucks. So on December 12th, when we sold 240 units, do you see we sold 240 units? That we sold all of the 144 units that we just purchased. And what's left over is we have to grab 96 units from the beginning inventory. So then once we do that sale, we only have 214 units left of the beginning inventory at 88 bucks. So then when we sell another 166 units, we have to, all we have is to grab them from the beginning inventory. Okay. Then we purchased 240 units at $96. So we have those 48 units from beginning inventory plus our latest 240 units at $96. So on December 31st, when we sell 200 units, do you see that we show all of them are coming from the latest purchase? So what's left on hand? We've got 48 units from the beginning inventory, plus we have 40 units on hand from that latest purchase. Any questions on that? Is it making sense? Because the price rose from $88 in the December 1st inventory, to $96 for the December 20th purchase, we expect that the first in, first out inventory would be higher, okay? So first in, first out means those ending units that remain in inventory would look higher. Since we went with LIFO, our cost of goods sold is higher, okay? And if cost of goods sold is higher, then that means our gross profit would be lower under LIFO than it would be under FIFO. Now, beginning inventory purchases and sales data for the prepaid cell phones for December are, again, the same stuff. We're going to now take the FIFO method, the first in, first out method. So in doing this, we're going to take the oldest units sitting in there are the first ones we sell. As you see in this example, on this one, we've got total costs of 54832 and we have ending inventory of 8448 Do you see under this method? Our total costs are 55 to 16 um, for cost of goods sold, and our amount sitting in ending inventory is 8064 So you see under FIFO, we have a greater cost sitting in our ending inventory, okay, in a period of rising prices. The following units for an items are available for sale during the year. So again, we have a beginning inventory, then we have a sell, then we have a purchase, then a sell, then a purchase, then a sell. The firm uses the perpetual inventory system. There are 7,700 units of the item on hand at the end of the year. What is the total cost of the ending inventory? using FIFO and using LIFO. So here you see, if we use FIFO, we would have 
$162 at 7,700 units. So the way we fi fix, uh, figure this <clears throat> is do you see here using FIFO, we started with 9,200 units, we sold 5,400 units. How many are left then? 3,800 units, right? We have 3,800 units here, and we added 12,800 units. When we sell this 10,400 units, wouldn't we sell this 3,800 units first, and then the remaining would come from this first purchase? Now we have another purchase of 14,100. When we sell this 12,006, won't we take everything we can from this purchase here? So our ending inventory is going to be a cost at $162, right? Because the first ones in are the first ones we want to sell. Okay? So you see 7,700 units at $162. That's our ending inventory. Now, under the LIFO method, it's a little trickier. Because under LIFO, <coughs> here, that's going to be the same. This, for, this um, first purchase here, when we sell this 10,400, aren't we selling those from this 12,800? So how many units will be left? 2,400 here? Got it? And we've still got the remaining 3,800 3, here, don't we? So then we have another purchase and another sell. Under LIFO, we're going to sell these units right here. So how many units do we have left after we sell these 12,600? 1,500? Does that make sense? So do you see using LIFO, we're going to have 3,800 at 150. We're going to have... Uh, 2,400 at 155, and we're going to have 1,500 at 162. One fifty, the one fifty five, the one fifty two, or did I say one seventy two? It should be one sixty two. I made the numbers wrong. But do you understand under LIFO? Since we're always selling the newest items, it's the oldest items that are staying in inventory. The following units of a particular item are available for sale during the year. The firm uses the weighted average cost method with the perpetual inventory system. Determine the cost of goods sold for each sale and the inventory balance after each sale. So this one is a little different. This one is showing the weighted average, not the FIFO, not the LIFO, the weighted average. So here, if 9,000 units were available at 50 bucks, and the first sale on March 18th are 7,000 units, all of that's got to come from the beginning inventory. So we know what's on hand afterwards. Then we purchased 8,000 more units at $56.50. .50. We then need to come up with a weighted average. We show our total cost, we to show our total units and we come up with a weighted average. That weighted average is going to be 
and 20 cents a unit. So when we sell those 8,000 units, do you see how we're coming up with $55.20 for the cost of the sale? Then when we purchase 4,000 more units, we need to show, okay, we need to add that additional 4,000 units at 240,000 to what is still available, the 2,000 units at 110,400. We add the 110,400 plus the 240,000 to come up with our 350,400. Divide that by our 6,000 units to come up with a weighted average again. The most important thing to be aware of is we have to recalculate after every transaction what our new weighted average is. Be it because we purchased product or what's left over after we sold product. Here, weighted average cost flow method under the perpetual inventory system. Here we've got our purchases and sales and our balance. The firm uses the weighted average cost method with a perpetual inventory system. Determine the cost of goods sold for each sale and the inventory balance after each sale. I want you guys to take a couple minutes and let's do this. And then if someone is willing to explain how they did it, okay? Give you about three minutes, guys. All right? If someone wants to volunteer, I would love that. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, who wants to take it? Yes. With the last three thousand fifty five dollars, just in case I did it wrong. The weighted average, the last one. Yeah. Yes, that is correct. Okay. Three thousand and fifty five dollars, correct? Yeah. Yep, you got it. You want to go through it? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So I did uh, the four thousand and fifty dollars. And a sale of twenty five hundred dollars or units, which brings it to fifteen hundred units at yep. fifty dollars. Mm -hmm. We bought forty five hundred at fifty four dollars, mm -hmm. which gets you six thousand units at fifty three dollars. Perfect. Uh, and then you sold five thousand, which means you have a thousand at fifty three dollars. Excellent. And then you bought two thousand at fifty six dollars, and then that means you have three thousand. Excellent. Does anyone understand how he did that? He had to continue to update his totals and his items. Yes. Is the uh, weighted so the weighted average that you um because I ended up with just a slightly different number by the end of it, fifty three thirty three so much, but uh, for my ending average unit cost, you add the average of only the inventory you still have left. Correct. You don't weigh in what you've already sold. No. Okay. No. That's so you you only keep what you have left and then if you have new purchases you add those units, those total costs and come up with a new average. Got okay? You're just averaging the cost of those? Correct. Just right. keeping it updated. Um, assume the business in exercise nine maintains a perpetual inventory system. Determine the cost of goods sold for each sale in the inventory balance using FIFO. Again, guys, it's kind of ad nauseum. I'm repeating it, but the best way to learn this stuff is to do a problem, problem, problem. Okay. Which is why I'm showing you these. FIFO, again, guys, if all we have on hand is 4,000 units, we're going to sell 2,500 of those 4,000 units, right? And then have 1,500 left. When we purchase 4,500 units of $54, we have now 1,500 units of 50 and then 4,500 units of 54. On September 2nd, when we sell 5,000 units, we're going to sell our oldest inventory first. That 1,500 units we're going to sell, and then we have to sell 3,500 of the latest purchase. Then when we sell another 5,000 units, we're going to sell, um, excuse me, uh, purchase, no, that we already showed that sell. Then when we purchased 2,000 units at $56, what's left on hand is we have 1,000 units left of the beginning inventory and 2,000 units left of what we just purchased. Does that make sense, guys? Using LIFO, Again, we're going to do the same method. We're just going to always take the last purchases to show the first sale. So April, January 1st and April 19th are all the same. And then on June 30th, when we made that purchase of 4,500 units, we show that in our ending inventory. When we sell 
5,000 units on September 2nd. We're going to take all those 4,500 units from our latest purchase, and then we're going to take 500 units from beginning inventory. Then we show another purchase of 2,000 units. So we have on hand the 1,000 units from the very beginning inventory plus the 2,000 units we just purchased. When we use the periodic method, we don't keep track throughout the period. We only keep track at the end of the period. So to show this using the LIFO, we use the same data as in the perpetual method for when we purchase. So we show our inventory and our purchases for the whole month. So you see here we have 2,100 units with a total of 45,180. The physical count on January 31st shows that 800 units are left on hand. When we use the FIFO method, the cost of goods on hand is made up of the most recent cost. So we assume everything previously has been sold and the only thing that's left are the most recent purchases which should have been 600 units of the January 30th purchased and then 200 units of the January 10th purchase. So you see, we started with 20,000 units. We purchased 25,180 units. So we had on hand the 45,180. We show our ending inventories, the most current units, to give us our cost of goods sold. We don't keep track of our cost of goods sold after each use, use after each sale, using the periodic inventory. We only keep track of it at the end of the period. When we're dealing with the periodic inventory, you see the purchases are showing up all along. Then you see the cost of goods sold and the ending inventory is broken up there at the end of the period. When the LIFO method is used, the cost of goods on hand at the end of the period is made up of the earliest costs. So you see here, if you deduct the cost of the January 31st inventory of 16,000 from the cost of goods available for sale of the 45,180, it shows what our cost of goods sold is gonna be. We're gonna just keep our beginning inventory the most we can. I mean, we did sell some of that beginning inventory, but we're gonna keep that on hand. This again shows you when you're doing the LIFO method how we account for ending inventory and how we account for cost of goods sold. And then the same is true with the periodic, the weighted average. We will show everything available for sale, divide that by the number of units to come up with for the month, an average cost in inventory and cost of goods sold. So here, again, our cost of goods available, it's the same price, the same amount. The way we calculate the ending inventory is we weight all of the cost of goods available divided by the number of units. And that's how we come up with not only our cost of goods sold, but our ending inventory. It's all an average. Guys, who wants to take this one? Which of the following statements regarding inventory costing under the periodic inventory system is correct? At the time of sale, no entry is made to cost of goods sold. 
The LIFO method is not allowed. That's not true. There is no need to make a cost flow assumption when identical units are acquired at different units. A physical inventory is not necessary. There's only one that's good there, A. When the periodic inventory systems used, only revenue gets recorded during sales. At the end of the accounting period, it's then when we take a physical account to determine what's on hand and what's sitting in inventory at the end of the year or what was sold during the year, during the period. Okay, here is our three, here will be our three methods of covering periodic inventory. Remember, periodic is when we don't keep track of our cost of goods sold during the period. We only do it at the end. An item, a, units of item available for sale during the period are shown here. There are 1,500 units of the item in the physical inventory at December 31st. The periodic inventory system is used. Determine the inventory cost using FIFO, LIFO, and weighted average. So 1,500 units that are being used. Did I not put the solutions on here? Dummy me. Um, so let's go through this and figure out, I'm going to have to pull it up here, how we, ca we calculate this. Okay. Who wants to take FIFO? Let me pull this up real quick. I should have it on here, but I'm scared I'm going to screw up my, oh, well, uh, maybe I won't. 6-12. December 31st at the end of the first year or at the end of this? This, this year. This year the, new financial solutions. Chapter, six, what problem is this? 6-12? Okay. Mm, how do I? Uh, can I rotate clockwise? Okay. That's 11. I want 13, don't I? Is it 12? Thank you. Okay. So if we use the FIFO method, let me go back here. If we use the FIFO method, we're going to have 1,500 units available. Wouldn't we have 15 units on hand at four bucks? Okay. Okay. Excuse me. That would be using the the LIFO method if they were all sold. So using the FIFO method, excuse me, let me figure this out. Using Ah, wrong one. There are 15 units of the item in the physical inventory at December 31st using the periodic. Determine the inventory cost by FIFO. So if 15 units are at, on hand using FIFO, that means the latest purchases are what's left in inventory, right? So wouldn't the latest purchases be the 1,500 units at 10 bucks? 
correct? And using LIFO, what LIFO stands for is the most recent purchases are the first ones sold. So the very oldest inventory, which is the beginning balance, wouldn't those 1,500 units be sitting there still on hand at $4? Right? Then the weighted average, wouldn't we take 5,500 units at four bucks, 6,400 units at six bucks, 6,000 units at $8, 2,100 units at $10, come up with a total, come up with a total of units, 12, 4, 17, 18, no, 79, 20,000 20, units. So wouldn't we in that case, excuse me, 20, we would come up with all the units and then we would come up with a total of 20,000 units divided by all of its total to come up with $6.47 a unit and show our 1500 units at six dollars and 47 cents yes how come we did it differently the last time when, when this guy did the did the average he just averaged all the the costs that's what the, we're doing i mean we're you're doing the total cost but if we just averaged the dollar amount it'd be 28 so it'd be seven dollars a unit you know, We're, it's got to be a weighted average, though. So we've got to weight average it because do you see how some units are at $4? 5,500 units are at 4. 6,400 units are at 6. So we can't take a, a simple average. We have to weight them all because different quantities were bought at different prices. Yeah. That wasn't what we did in the last problem. When yeah. We did the weighted. What I do is I, I do 5,500 times 4, and then I do 6,400 times 6, and then 6,000 times 8, and then I divide all that, well, and then 2,100 times 10, and then I add up how many total units we have, mm -hmm. and then divide that dollar amount by the total number of units. Yeah, but I just mean well, the last time we did that. Yeah, last, we did. The last time we did the same, I thought it was. I thought we did it Maybe we time. spoke about it, you know, but we did it the exact same. It was right. I don't. Uh, weighted average. Let's see. Weighted average. Um, I don't remember if it was periodic or perpetual that we just did, but it's the same method. You have to take a weighted average because different quantities are being purchased at different prices, okay? And so, yeah, um, and I apologize if I confused you. Yeah, you have to total all of the costs by the units just so we come up with a weighted average. Um, let me see where I'm at. Okay, so does that make sense, guys? How we ended up doing that, uh, and I'm sorry I lost the answer key in here, but you basically, um, right here, this isn't showing any sales. This is just kind of letting you know, here's how many units were on hand, what is the ending inventory, okay? Moving on, the way you compare the various methods. The three methods are going to yield different amounts. The cost of goods sold is going to be different <clears throat> if you use the FIFO, LIFO, or weighted average, along with the gross profit, net income, and ending inventory. No, guys, these methods over several years will all wash balance. But from one year to the next, you're going to have differing figures. But overall, over a period of two or three year, two years, they're going to balance out. Using the perpetual inventory system with sales of 39,000, 
1,300 units at 30 bucks, here's how they're going to show out. When you're dealing with first in, first out, you're going to see, in this case, a higher gross profit in days where there are rising prices. You will always see a lower gross profit in periods of rising prices with LIFO. And the weighted average will always be in between the two methods. No, with FIFO, your gross profit's going to be higher, but your, um, your inventory is also going to be higher because those goods are from the most recent purchases. With LIFO, the cost of goods sold are going to be higher figures, which nets a lower gross profit. And your inventory is going to be lower because it's, it's the older items. And your weighted average will always be in the middle. Effects of changing costs, costs using FIFO versus LIFO. When costs are increasing, then you're going under FIFO, you're going to have a higher gross profit and you're going to have higher ending inventory. When prices are decreasing, the opposite will happen. Now, guys, it's not that often that prices decrease, does it? I wish it did. It's like a global pandemic global pandemic but you know during that global pandemic a lot of cost increased like yeah. lumber oh, yeah. you know we had just been, moved into our home in 2020 and the lumber costs were out of this world and i remember my husband calling our insurance guy and saying i want you to increase the price of our home because we had just gone through a fire so we were keen with you know worrying about costs and the price of lumber had like doubled. Mm -hmm. Now I think it's gone back down, but it was crazy. Um, cost is the primary basis for valuing and reporting inventories in the financial statements. Inventory may be valued at other than cost when the cost of replacing items is below the recorded cost or there's issues with the inventory. No there is something called lower of cost or market. If the market value is lower than the purchase cost, the lower of cost or market method applies. Market as used in lower of cost is what we call the net realizable value of the inventory. So what that means, and they'll usually tell you what that net realizable value is, it's the estimated selling price minus direct costs of disposal. Here's an example. Direct costs of disposal include selling expenses, such as special advertising or commissions. Assuming here's some inf information. We have some damaged equipment sitting in inventory of $1,000. It's going to cost us $800 um, our, our plan is to sell it for $800 and it's going to cost us $150 to sell it. So the lower of cost our market is $650. What we are selling it for, the $800 minus our cost to sell it. $650 is lower of cost our market. So in this case, they purchased it for $1,000. But when the cost to sell it less its selling cost is below what we purchased it for, we can write down the inventory to the lower of cost or market. In this case, we would mark down this item by $350. Do you see why? Because what we purchased it for is less, is greater than the lower of cost or market. We always want to be conservative in our inventory. We don't want it to show it's larger than it needs to be. The lower of cost or market 
can be applied with each item in inventory or classes of inventory. No, this can happen oftentimes when, say there's a um, um, PlayStation. Is a new one coming out anytime soon? So let's say we have the latest PlayStation and for Christmas, the new one's gonna come out. What happens to all these old PlayStations? They're going down, aren't they? So that's when it happens quite often is what we might have paid for those PlayStations is going to tank. So we figure out what can we sell them for minus the cost to sell them is what we'll write down that inventory to. It happens with iPhones too, possibly. If the what we purchased uh, the iPhone or an I, um, iPhone iWatch, if when the new ones come out, all of a sudden that price tanks, then we have to look at that. Um, so no, the matching of price declines to the period in which they occur is the advantage of using the lower of cost or market. Basically, we have to write down the inventory to accurately reflect the new costs. This determines how we go about writing down inventory. As you see here, we've got the quantity, the cost we paid for the unit, the market price called net realizable value. We have to go to each one and see which is lower. Do you see that echo? We paid 1025, but the lower of cost or market here is at 950. If the low LCM, the lower of cost or market is lower than the cost, we have to write down that inventory. So in that case, that's going to be written down. Look at Foxtrot. Which is lower, cost or market value? Cost. So we don't do anything with it. Look at Sierra. Which is um, lower, the cost we paid for it or the market value? Market value. Do you see how we have to write that one down? If cost is the lowest, we do nothing. If the market value is lower, we need to adjust it, okay? Inventory is reported in the balance sheet as a current asset. The following are reported on the balance sheet or accompany notes to the balance sheet. Which method of determining the inventory we're using and then how we value the inventory if we have valued it as cost or lower of cost or market. With Best Buy showing current assets, here you see their, cert, their inventory on their balance sheet. You see it's called merchandise inventory. Merchandise inventories are recorded at the lower of cost or net realizable value, the market. The weighted average cost method is used to determine the cost of inventory. Isn't that interesting? We know Best Buy uses the weighted cost method in determining their inventory. 95% of public companies use FIFA. Why? Because it's easiest. Any errors in inventory are ultimately going to affect the balance sheet and the income statement. Some reasons inventory errors can it, it, um, happen because physical counts were screwed up, costs were incorrectly assigned, inventory in transit might not be included or excluded from inventory, or if you have consignment inventory, it might not be included. Inventory errors arise when conducting the end of year physical inventory. For example, merchandise that was ordered FOB shipping point may be in transit at the end of the year and not counted as part of inventory because we know FOB shipping point, when do we gain access to that inventory? At the shipping point. 
So it's not on hand in our inventory. Do you see how we could have screwed that up? Even though the inventory has not been received, the title to the goods have passed to the buyer at the time of shipment, so they should be included. Sometimes they're consigners, so we're holding consigned inventory. Um, inventory errors can affect the income statement and balance sheet. So sometimes if in ending inventory is overstated in a current period, then that means in that current period the cost of goods sold would be understated. In other words, if we're showing too much inventory on hand, what probably happened with our cost of goods sold? We didn't show enough, okay? Or the opposite is true. If we maybe didn't show enough inventory on hand, maybe we had too much sitting in cost of goods sold. Ultimately, errors are gonna play out between one year and the next and, and balance out. But that specific year, the financial statements could be off. Okay, um, this just shows when cost of goods sold in this Zula Industries is, if they've been understated their cost of goods sold by 30,000, well, their gross profit is overstated, their net income is overstated, and their inventory is overstated. If their cost of goods sold is overstated, then their gross profit would be understated. But ultimately, between one year and the next, they're all going to balance out. Guys, Lakeview Forest Products sells an item that originally cost $1,500. Due to obsolescence, its estimated selling price is now $1,200, with $200 of estimated selling expenses. What, using the lower of cost or market, what would be the adjusted value in the inventory? D? Excellent. So this basically, I feel like I need to get moving here. This basically shows you how do you calculate the lower of cost or market. If, as you see here, class one model A, the cost is lower than the market value. You do nothing. You do nothing with B. But what about Model C? Because the market value is lower, we're going to need to adjust that item in inventory. Same with Model D. So no, if the market value is lower, we're going to need to adjust our inventory to show the lower of cost or market value. Um, and I'm so sorry, I probably put too many exercises on here, but know that when errors do occur, it can ultimately affect the financial statements. So if the inventory is being understated, that generally means that your cost of good is being overstated, which means your net income is being understated. The end of this shows some ratios that we're gonna probably cover in the last chapter of the class anyway, but maybe take some time to look at inventory turnover. The goal, guys, is you need enough inventory on hand um, so people can buy your products, or you can sell them but you don't want too much inventory on hand that you're wasting money and that inventory can become obsolescent. Um, there is a final method of showing um, a, a gross profit method of figuring out inventory that you can look at and the retail method. Um, I'm so sorry I got myself a little carried away. Any questions before we end this chapter?